Now once more I must ride with my knights to defend what was and the dream of what could be. Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel. Today we're going to be examining the strangest events, unquestioned history. We have numerous historical events that have many anomalies in them. We're going to be looking at some select events today in this exploration. And we're going to see exactly what odd things have occurred in these historical events. And yet at the same time, these events are unquestioned. They are well documented. And they have brought us to the present. Let's begin our exploration. We begin by examining the Know Nothing Movement, or the American Party, also known as the Native American Party, 1844 to 1860. This was a nativist party. Now, American politics have always been very intriguing, and yet at the same time very simplistic, as there's always primarily been two parties, from the very incipients of the nation. This particular nativist party, though, was founded, <laughs> yes, they even use that terminology for a political party, in 1844 to promote the rights of what they called Native Americans. Not what Native Americans are referred to today, but Native Americans in the mid-19th century, who were Protestant Americans. They were concerned about the sudden influx of immigrants from Ireland and Germany, primarily Catholic, because in their minds, the Catholic Church was a separate authority that was not under the secular authority that was legitimate American authority. So they founded this political party in 1844 to appeal to the good nature of Native Americans to oppose all this immigration. Now, why was this sudden immigration coming from Ireland and Germany? We're told that there was a potato famine in Ireland, and we're told there was a lot of social injustice in Germany. The revolutions of 1848, which the channel previously explored in the Reset War of 1848. So what was really going on? Well, it seems as though this political party was a very foundational movement to propagate the rights of people who viewed themselves as Native Americans or nativists. And indeed, our good friends over at the Smithsonian Magazine are quick to point out that native sentiments or nativist sentiments are very incorrect and that it is very foolhardy to embrace any sort of anti-immigration platform. What's unique about the Know Nothing Party, though, is just how briefly it existed. We have accounts of immigrants being attacked who worked on the Erie Canal, and this was back in the 1820s in New York, and yet at the same time it didn't seem to hinder the construction of the Erie Canal. We're also well aware of the fact that Irish and Germans make up the vast majority of many of the great cities that we've explored, and that they're responsible for building the cities. I mean, if I had a cent for every time someone told me about how Germans took part in the construction of Cincinnati, but isn't it interesting how we supposedly had this political party from 1844 to 1860 who's even reputed to have engaged in many violent acts against members of these immigrants in many of the cities that we've explored, and we did recount that in certain situations, such as in Louisville. But how exactly did a bunch of Germans end up in Cincinnati if there was this political party that was opposed to them, and yet they seemed to be able to continue to flourish and build the wonderful city that we saw. KN ticket, isn't that very interesting? Now, of course, we can see the parallels with at least what is presented to us of politics in America today about how the whole concept of nativism and resisting immigration is totally incorrect and nobody should embrace it. It's very fascinating, though, that the exact same political principle that was in existence before the Civil War is still one of the primary political principles that's in existence now. And the other interesting thing is the Know Nothing Party's antipathy towards the Pope. It should be noted that during that time, the official history tells us that the Kingdom of Italy was snagging land from the Papal States until the Pope was pretty much confined to the Vatican. We checked that out in the Vatican exploration. But what was really the aim of this political party? It's hard to say in full terms what they were trying to do because where the real historical anomalies come from is the fact that this political party was very short-lived. It was a really odd time in American political history because while so many of us are more familiar with the two-party system or the bipartisan system, which is what we all know we'll live and die by because you know if you had a third major political party in the United States, people might be a little confused. Things are either right or they're wrong. You either agree with them or you disagree with them. And you shouldn't think anywhere beyond those lines. And we're also told that this nativist party, the Know Nothing Party, or the American Party, or the Native American Party, or whatever name you want to call it, was really one of the foundational events that caused America to go to its bipartisan system. Indeed, the end of the Know Nothing Party came about from the United States Civil War, and we're told that they couldn't really agree upon their platform with slavery, 
because when most of them joined the Republican Party, the Republican Party, at least back during this time frame, was opposed to slavery. In fact, they even called many Republicans who opposed slavery radical Republicans, and so on and so forth. And so, just like that, that was the end of the Know Nothing Party. They had no platform, and they simply evaporated. The U.S. Civil War comes along, and then the next thing you know, you have Irish brigades fighting each other on opposite battles in North and South. So what are your thoughts on the Know Nothing Party? What do you think it really represented? What was it all really about? And why did it just simply vanish, with nobody really protesting? We now consider the story of James Forrestal, the first Secretary of Defense in the United States. James Forrestal came from a very strong Irish Catholic family, indeed the very people that the Know Nothing Party apparently opposed. He grew up and he had a strict sense of discipline and eventually made a name for himself as a financier on Wall Street. Finally, he rose to position of Secretary of the Navy during World War II under the Roosevelt administration and then eventually became the first nation Secretary of Defense. This is the house he lived in, a nice little old world house in Washington, D.C., the Prospect House, built in 1788. Some very nice brickwork on it. But going back to the story of James Forrestal, when he was initially appointed as Secretary of the Navy during World War II, he oversaw one of the largest and most effective shipbuilding programs in the history of the known lands. We'll look at uh, shipbuilding figures when we look at the sudden expansion of the United States Navy as another one of our historical anomalies. Forrestal was a proponent of the Carrier Battle Group, now called the Carrier Strike Group, the Navy being centered around large aircraft carriers with many supporting ships, and being able to project expeditionary power across the lands. However, Forrestal was not a full supporter of the New Deal, at least it was stated he did not champion it. Additionally, he came to odds with his president, President Harry S. Truman, in terms of the management of the armed forces. Indeed, Forrestal opposed the creation of a Department of Defense and preferred the old War Department. Interestingly enough, when you consider the United States military's record since it's been under the Department of Defense. Regardless, Forrestal was a very effective Secretary of Defense, being able to work with many different people, and he tried to oppose the crippling of the United States military, or at least the vast reduction that occurred at the end of World War II. Forrestal stated that the United States faced a grave threat from the Soviet Union, and that the threat of expansion from the communist powers needed to be checked. The other intriguing aspect is when we consider the fact that not only was the United States military very rapidly reduced after World War II, there are even accounts of equipment simply being tossed overboard from ships, much in the same way as we remember steam locomotive engines being crashed into each other at the start of the 20th century, and we even have video footage of that. Well, there's a lot of footage that indicate that a lot of military surplus equipment was lost simply because the government didn't make money to store it. Forrestal also ran afoul of Drew Pearson. Drew Pearson was a journalist for one of our favorite periodicals, the Washington Post. Drew Pearson was critical of Forrestal as he felt that Forrestal did not adequately support the partition of Palestine plan, which had ended World War II. Forrestal argued that if the partition of Palestine was carried out, that it would anger many of the Arab states which the United States was reliant on for oil. However, Pearson criticized Forrestal, saying that this was not the right viewpoint to have, and as a result of which, Forrestal lost a lot of credibility with President Truman. And indeed, he also paid for it in other ways. Pearson would run afoul of problems of his own, though, when he'd come across Senator Joseph McCarthy from Wisconsin as they engaged in a fist fight in 1950. It stated that Pearson lost because McCarthy caught him off guard. Very interesting series of events, though, is that uh, Drew Pearson, despite having known communist sympathizers on his actual staff, he was never investigated by the House Un-American Committee, and getting into a fight with the very senator who led the Red Scare tactics of the 1950s, he was never investigated. In fact, he was saved by Richard Nixon in his little fist fight with Joseph McCarthy. We have many images, though, that show Drew Pearson meeting with subsequent U.S. President Lyndon Johnson. So what exactly is going on here? It's very hard to say. Why wasn't Drew Pearson ever more stringently investigated? Why was a journalist allowed to run around and seemingly dictate U.S. policy? Back to James Forrestal, he ran into other issues when he continued to challenge the policies of President Truman and President Truman's failure to fund the armed forces. Indeed, the United States armed forces were left in a very state of depreciation after World War II. Now, it makes sense that there was a reduction in forces that followed, and yet at the same time, there seemed to be an awareness of the threat. 
In the presidential election of 1948, James Forrestal had made an arrangement with Thomas Dewey, the man running against President Truman, that he would continue on as Secretary of Defense under a Dewey administration. Indeed, many political pundits at the time believed that Dewey was going to defeat Truman, but in fact the opposite occurred. Well, the story of course was leaked out by Forrestal's friend Pearson, and Truman asked him to resign immediately. And thus was the end of perhaps the most effective Secretary of Defense that the United States Department of Defense ever had, the subsequent Secretary of Defense is having a very mixed reputation at best. James Forrestal was hospitalized because of the overwork and pressure, at least that's what the official story says, and one of his treatments was to prescribe sedatives. He held himself to a high standard of discipline, and many people say he had burned himself out. And yet the treatment at what is today Walter Reed, an institution that is certainly not short in controversy, especially in its treatment of veterans during the height of the American conflict in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Unfortunately, Forrestal is stated to have jumped out of a window and committed suicide, or at least fallen to his death. Forrestal was succeeded by this man, Lewis Johnson, who became Secretary of Defense after Forrestal was asked to resign. Lewis Johnson carried out Truman's directive to continue to reduce the forces of the United States military and not carry out proper funding. This left the United States military in a very poor state of readiness by the start of the 1950s. It should also be noted there was a conflict of interest with Lewis Johnson as he was a board member of the company that procured and was awarded the contract to develop the B-36 bomber. The B-36 bomber considered a billion dollar blunder as it was a propeller driven bomber in which the Soviet and communist forces were armed with the MiG-15, the first jet powered fighter. Therefore the B-36, despite all the development costs being spent on it, was already obsolete by the time it rolled off of the tarmac. And indeed, it played virtually no effective role in the Korean War and was quickly retired from service by 1959, having no use. We'll also take a look at the change in the United States military, looking at the overall number of personnel from 1940 going to 400,000, over 12 million at the height of World War II, and then by 1950 reduced to 1.5 million. It should also be noted that many units were totally under-equipped, lacking heavy weapons, tanks, and armor and this would play a terrifying role on the effectiveness of the U.S. military in responding to the Korean conflict in 1950. And suddenly Truman found that he did not have an effective military to respond to the invasion of South Korea by North Korea. And indeed, this nearly led to total defeat, as not only was the Republic of Korean Army pushed back to the south, but the UN forces, namely the U.S. Army and other supporting elements, were quickly trapped in the Pusan perimeter. There were many units that lacked heavy equipment, tanks, and even effective anti-tank fighting capabilities. It was only after the North Koreans had finally outrun their lines of logistics that the UN forces were able to build up an effective presence in South Korea and counterattack effectively. The United States military paid a heavy price though for being completely unprepared, and how many soldiers and service members died who didn't have to die? It's quite a condemnation when we look at what was warned at by James Forrestal and he seemed to be prescient in a lot of ways. And yet, unfortunately, for his efforts, he died. And yet, very few people actually question what was really going on with James Forrestal, and yet have no questions that there's no historical anomalies with what he was really trying to stand for, even though he was proven right by the subsequent events. What are your thoughts on James Forrestal? From 1945 to 1949, the United States held a nuclear monopoly over all the lands. The United States was the first nation to develop a nuclear weapon, and therefore it had a nuclear monopoly at the end of World War II. Now, what exactly did the United States achieve with its nuclear monopoly? The development of the nuclear weapon was considered one of the end-all be-all goals of all nations in World War II. There was a great fear that the Axis powers were going to develop the atom bomb first, or the wonder weapon as it was called. There was much effort devoted, especially by the Germans, to the development of the weapon. However, the United States Manhattan Project and many of its leading scientific figures enabled them to develop and detonate the first test nuclear weapon. As a result of the fact that the United States was the only nation that had the technology of nuclear fission that would eventually be developed into nuclear fusion, the splitting and the amalgamation of the atom, 
This led to the ability of developing weapons with tremendous explosive yields. Explosive yields that were enough to level cities and destroy nations. And certainly, the United States was the first nation to be aware of the destructive potential of nuclear weapons. Finally, humanity, in its long quest for destroying itself with weapons of mass destruction, had succeeded in its goal. And certainly, since the United States had been the first nation to develop and test these weapons, it had to know better than anybody the destructive potential of nuclear weapons. The situation at the end of World War II was the Axis had been defeated, but now it was the East against the West. Capitalism against Communism. The official history tells us that the Soviet Union had a long-standing rivalry with the United States. Indeed, the United States had intervened during the Russian Civil War at the end of World War I. It's often not mentioned that American troops participated in numerous expeditions to the Soviet Union, or Russia at the time, to try to prevent the collapse of the White Russians, or the Russians that supported the Imperial family. There are numerous well-documented images of these expeditions that show foreign forces in many major Russian cities. The United States, Great Britain, Japan, even a foreign legion from the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia participated in the area. And here you can see an image of that Czechoslovakian legion. So, it seems as though Russia definitely had reason to be xenophobic, as their nation had been invaded by virtually every other allied nation at the end of World War I. So we can understand why Russia, now the Soviet Union at the end of World War II, would fear a nuclear-armed United States. And yet, at the same time, one would expect that since the United States was the only nation in the land, in the world, in 1945, that had nuclear weapons, that it would be able to achieve essentially any sort of foreign policy goals that it would want, as there is no nation that could possibly match it. And here we have an image of American troops in Vladivostok. So what exactly happened? We know how everything turned out, that the Soviet Union was able to develop its own atomic bomb in 1949, but that was still four years that the United States was the only nuclear-armed nation in the land. So what did the United States do with its nuclear monopoly, as it were? Well, it seems as though it really didn't do much of anything. In fact, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which many debated were unnecessary as the entry of the Soviet Union into World War II would have forced Japan to surrender anyway, but regardless of whether it was necessary or not, those bombings were supposed to be a demonstration to the Soviet Union of the destructive potential of these weapons. And yet, oddly enough, the Soviet Union seemed to proceed very aggressively with its foreign policy, managing to entrench itself in Eastern Europe and across the lands. And the United States seemed quite powerless to respond, despite the fact that at the end of World War II it had the largest military, and it was also the only armed nuclear power in the world. And yet it was outmaneuvered politically and diplomatically by the Soviet Union in many situations. And we saw how, looking at the James Forrestal story, how that led to the conflict in Korea. And indeed, the United States military was caught in a very unfortunate position of not being prepared for that conflict. At the same time, there was the Berlin blockade. Berlin was divided at the end of World War II, and it stood deep within what would become East Germany. The Soviet Union decided to turn up political pressure, and it cut off the land corridors and logistics of the Western powers supporting their forces and the people of West Berlin. Instead of answering with an escalation of force or even a threat of a nuclear deterrent, the United States simply executed the Berlin Airlift in conjunction with the other Western Allied powers at the time and managed to supply the citizens of West Berlin and their forces accordingly with an airlift. Isn't it interesting, though, that the United States did not simply respond by saying that, with the imposition of the Berlin blockade, that they would simply respond with nuclear weapons? The Soviet Union did not possess any nuclear weapons at that time. The United States could have simply bombed Soviet cities until they had capitulated. Now, that might seem like that's very ruthless, but yet this was the same president who had authorized the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to begin with. So what exactly had happened to President Truman? Why didn't he approach a more hawkish stance, or at least a nuclear deterrent? Did Harry S. Truman's old mentor, Tom Pendergast, not prepare him for the realities of diplomacy and actual foreign policy?
It's rather insane to think of the fact that there was a nuclear-armed nation that was the only nation in the world that was outmaneuvered politically by its greatest rival. And indeed, it seems as though Harry Truman didn't really seem to consider that there was any other alternative. He simply always looked for the least aggressive response. It's almost as though there was something else going on. But what do you think? Why was it the United States was not able to achieve more with its nuclear monopoly? Instead, what we had was a Cold War that lasted for nearly 40 years, with the world at the brink of nuclear annihilation. Certainly, Harry S. Truman had to have been advised by that. And most certainly, there should have been a stronger U.S. response to the attempts of development of an atomic bomb by the Soviet Union. But what are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments. What's the real true story? Nuclear war avoided 1949 until now. The prospect of a full-scale nuclear exchange or a nuclear holocaust was a terror that the world faced for four or five decades, and many would say that we're still facing this horrific existential threat. A terrifying destruction of all the lands by unleashing nuclear weapons, with two fully armed nuclear powers facing off at each other, and with the slightest provocation, they could destroy the world, in the length of a lazy afternoon, as Carl Sagan would say. And we had many different specters of nuclear conflict. The possibility that a slight misunderstanding, a commander who misinterpreted something that happened, or even a computer glitch, could unleash the great forces of Armageddon. The power of nuclear weapons is very terrifying. The fact that a single nuclear weapon could completely destroy a city, or even more, Nuclear weapons reached yields of 50 megatons, the Tsar Bomba, the largest one ever tested by the Soviet Union. Most of the nuclear warheads were not quite as large in explosive yield, and yet many were built. We're told that at the height of the Cold War, there were over 60,000 nuclear warheads in, in service. And the whole point of so many nuclear warheads was there was supposed to be a pancaking attack. In other words, they would spread out as many nuclear detonations over the widest surface area that they could. What it would lead to is a total destruction of the land and the unleashing of a nuclear winter. There were also numerous films that we looked at in our live stream until the end of the world, where we considered the nuclear scare films Threads the Day After, and there's been many others, including When the Wind Blows. And in all these films, we're told that there is simply no hope to survive a nuclear exchange. Everyone and everything would die. And not only would it die, but it would die very slowly and very terribly. It would be the true situation where the living would envy the dead. It would be a literal hell on earth. Just the very prospect of the mushroom cloud terrified generations for many decades. And yet, despite all the odds indicating that there should have been some sort of nuclear exchange, somehow it was always averted. This terrifying reality, this horrific destiny, was always avoided. And how exactly was that possible? There's been some statisticians who attempted to calculate what the odds were of a nuclear exchange not occurring, given the situation that we were given during the Cold War. Two fully armed nuclear powers with intercontinental ballistic missiles that land launched could reach each other's cities within 20 minutes. If they were launched by submarines that were closer, six minutes. And we have no shortage of the incredibly terrifying nuclear footage of all the tests and the very durable cameras that were employed to record these tests, showing these strategic and tactical nuclear weapons detonating. There were also well-documented historical examples, such as the Cuban Missile Crisis, where World War III, or nuclear war, almost transpired in the Cuban Missile Crisis with the basing of medium-range ballistic missiles in Cuba by the Soviet Union. This showed a very terrifying threat that the United States had to respond to. And isn't it intriguing that a lot of this equipment was simply left out to be easily photographed? And it's most certain that the Soviets and the Cubans knew that this equipment could easily be photographed. And yet this led to a very distinct increase in tensions in the Cold War almost leading to a full-scale preemptive strike by the United States, 
Fortunately, the president and cooler heads prevailed, and they went with a mere policy of containment, blockading Cuba until all the warheads and delivery systems were removed, which they were. But this wasn't the only situation. There was also the Able Archer exercise in 1983. Able Archer was a full-scale military and political exercise carried out by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to prepare for a nuclear war. The only issue with it was the rehearsal was so realistic that the Soviets believed that NATO was actually preparing for a preemptive strike on Soviet forces, and as a result they increased the alert status of their own nuclear forces accordingly. Very frightening and terrifying display to realize that a mere exercise brought about World War III and a total nuclear exchange. There was also the statement that the KGB knew exactly what NATO was up to at all times, and yet conflicting accounts indicate that they did not, that the Soviet Union very nearly responded to Able Archer 83. There's also the consideration that at any point in time, many unstable commanders on either side of the so-called Iron Curtain could have initiated a nuclear strike on their own recognizance without any oversight. And then there's also the possibility of a computer glitch or some sort of malfunction, whether it's presenting a phantom attack on a computer screen or it's simply a pre-programmed attack in the event of a fail-safe being triggered. Whatever the case, for whatever reason, we somehow managed to avoid nuclear exchange until today, and we continue to avoid it every single day that we continue to go on. But what's the real reason for it? What are your thoughts? How exactly was a full-scale nuclear conflict avoided for the decades of the Cold War, and even until now? One of the most stunning achievements that we have revealed in history is the ability of the United States Navy to construct so many ships in a short period of time. We've considered other tremendous logistical achievements and other explorations, but we haven't looked at this particular achievement. Keep in mind that when the United States Navy embarked upon this shipbuilding program, this was at the start of World War II. And yet, when we look at the U.S. Navy active ship force levels from the history of the Navy military website itself, we can see that from 1938, the total active ships in the United States Navy went from 380 to simply six years later being 6,084. And really the most dramatic increase is being from 1941 to 1944. In a three-year period of time, this force increased well over sevenfold. An unbelievable increase in the number of ships. How were so many ships built in such a short period of time? It seems as though the United States' unlimited industrial capacity was brought to bear, that they were able to rapidly train a new entire workforce as many of the trained individuals had gone off to join the military. Although we know that in World War II, it being a strategic war, the organization of the use of labor was completely different. Yet, isn't it fascinating that this was achieved by a nation from 1941 to 1944 that just a few years earlier couldn't even feed its own people or provide employment and was in a total depression? Isn't it quite a stark contrast? Now, we're not questioning that. It's just quite an amazing consideration when you think about it that just a few short years earlier, the entire nation was in a Great Depression, and then because of the advent of war, it quickly switched to a war economy and was able to build many of these ships. Indeed, look at the fleet carriers. These are the largest capital ships of the United States Navy. And from 1942, granted, there were losses that were occurring as the United States entry into World War II started with a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Although fortuitously, none of the carriers were caught in Pearl Harbor, it merely involved battleships, we can see how quickly the fleet carrier strength increased from 7 to 25 in three years. And that was with combat losses as well to the Imperial Japanese Navy. We also look at the escort carriers going from 1 in 1941 to 65 in 1944. Now keep in mind, these are just actual combat ships or support ships for the U.S. Navy. We're not talking about all the cargo ships or the Liberty ships that the United States managed to build. The total amount of ships is staggering. But we do have some images of what post-World War II looked like when many of these ships were put in the mothball. And here we can see several escort carriers. 
numerous other support ships, so many ships filling the entire port. It's a staggering and tremendous achievement that the United States was able to achieve this kind of shipbuilding output in just a few short years. And yet we have other images that show this. Just unbelievable in terms of how many ships they were able to build in such a short amount of time. And we can see many other images of these mothballed fleets, which include all types of ships, whether it's carriers, cruisers, destroyers. Even in this image here, we can see a little bit of everything. We have uh, what looks to be an escort carrier. We have some light cruisers, other escort carriers. Just an impressive amount of ships. Consider all the materials that went into this. Consider training the labor force to be able to rapidly construct all these ships. And then not to mention, even the impressive expansion of the United States Navy to rapidly train and crew all of these ships. And then at the same time, to recall what happened with the complete disarmament of the United States military at the end of World War II to find itself unprepared to conduct the war in Korea initially. So what's your take on this entire situation? Was this just something that merely involved tremendous organization and the United States was able to achieve this? I mean, we know the United States achieved this. It is indeed very well documented. And it's very well documented that the United States seemed to disarm itself as fast as it could and did not take advantage of its nuclear monopoly and found itself in a grave disadvantage in the Korean conflict. But what are the real explanations for all these outcomes? And what are your thoughts on this sort of exploration? looking at some rather strange events that really did occur in history. Well, thank you for joining me.